So, you've got a 401k. Now what? Even if you leave the heavy lifting to the brainiacs at guided choice, it's a good idea to know how investing works. And if you're the do-it-yourself type, you need to understand how to invest appropriately. Don't worry, we're not going to show you tons of math. All you need to know to get started is that there are three big types of investments called asset classes, stock, bonds, and cash. Stock is just ownership in a company. There are many ways to classify stock. Two major ones are size, called market capitalization, or cap, and company location. Each classification has its own typical level of risk. Large cap stocks include the 500 biggest companies in the U.S. Apple, Walmart, Disney, Ford, McDonald's. Ever heard of the S&P 500 or blue chips? Same thing. Keep in mind, all stock is risky, but these are generally considered the least risky. Mid-cap stocks include roughly the next 400 companies by size. Smaller, but still fairly well established. They're considered riskier than large cap. Following large cap and mid cap, take the next 2,000 companies and you've got small cap stock. While they have potential for greater growth, they also have the greatest risk. Then there's international stock. Ownership in companies located in developed nations outside the US, like BMW in Germany and Sony in Japan. They carry about the same level of risk as US-based large cap stocks. The highest level of risk is found with emerging market stock. This is stock in companies located in developing nations like India, Mexico, and Russia. There are two ways to make or lose money in the stock market. You see, when you own a stock, you actually own a piece of a company. And as the value of that company increases, the stock price goes up. But if the value of the company goes down, the stock price goes down too. These fluctuations determine the amount of profit or loss. Another way to make money is when the company shares its yearly profit with you in the form of a dividend. Stock prices can go up or down dramatically for all kinds of reasons. As a result, stocks are the riskiest types of investment in your plan. But over a long time, they can also be the most rewarding. Next up, bonds. Bonds are just a loan to a company or government. They borrow by selling a bond, which is simply a promise to repay the buyer in a fixed number of years at a fixed interest rate. When you hear about the U.S. government borrowing money, have you ever wondered who they borrow from? Chances are, it's you, through the investments you make in bonds. If interest rates go down after you buy a bond, its value goes up. If interest rates go up, then your bond value will go down. How much the value goes up or down with a change in the interest rate depends on how long the bond is. The longer the bond, the more risk, as the more the value will go up or down with interest rate changes. However, in general, bonds are less risky than stocks. Cash is, well, cash. In a 401k, it's usually available as a money market or stable value fund. Unlike other assets, there's little risk that your money will lose value. But that doesn't mean there's no risk at all. If you hold too much cash, you are at risk that inflation will leave your money worth less compared to everything else. For example, in 1950, a nickel would buy you a Coke. But if you saved that nickel until today, you wouldn't have enough to buy that same Coke. Cash loses value over time. Most people with 401k plans invest in mutual funds. These hold many different individual stocks or bonds chosen by professionals for a given level of risk and potential reward. So, how do you choose the right mix for your specific needs? You may be surprised to hear that according to the majority of corporate pension plans in the world, there really is a single best way. It's called modern portfolio theory. The details are a lot of math, but understanding what's behind all the numbers is remarkably simple. In fact, you've probably already heard of it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You balance risk and reward by holding lots of different types of investments. The technical term is diversification, and it's the name of the game in investing. So how do you do it right? Most of us understand that if we take more risk, we expect more return. Let's look at the math. The line shows us that for any given level of risk, we can expect a certain rate of return, 
more risk, more return. The challenge, as you may be aware, is that markets don't move in a straight line. They go up and down. The goal is to buy low and sell high. When one investment type is down, you want to buy. At the same time, you want to sell an investment that is high. In the long run, they all tend to move up, just at different rates based on risk. Remember, this is your retirement savings, so to invest well, you need to diversify. The goal of diversification is what modern portfolio theory is all about, getting an optimal rate of return for the risk in the long run. To do that, you want to invest on what is known as the efficient frontier. The details of drawing the curve are just a lot of math. You could spend the spare hours of your days creating the efficient frontier on a very large spreadsheet, or you can let experts do it for you. In fact, the answers are already right where you want them, online, and probably already in your 401k plan. Guided Choice can give you personalized advice recommending a specific mix of stocks, bonds, and cash to reach your retirement income goal. You can even use it to try different strategies and project the results. Whether you take the investment recommendation from our brainiacs or choose to do it yourself, hopefully now you're a little more confident about how retirement investing works. Just remember, if you do it yourself, you need to rebalance your account at least annually to stay on the efficient frontier. Hey everybody, Darren Boros here. Today I'm in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, and I wanna walk you through the process on how I was able to buy my very first rental property. This is probably the question that I get asked most often. You know, how did you get into real estate investing? Uh, what was the first property you bought? And how can I buy my very first property and get involved in real estate investing? Because it's really about getting you on that path. The first property is often the most difficult one to buy. So once you buy that first property, then you start to feel more comfortable with real estate investing and you start working your, your way towards financial freedom and financial independence. And that's really what it's all about. It's no mistake that I'm in Mexico right now and traveling for the next two and a half months while the Canadian winter is going on back home. And my real estate investing has been the vehicle that's allowed me to be able to do that. So I wanna show you how I was able to do this so that you can start on that same path. And maybe you don't have the same goals as I have. Maybe you wanna be able to put your kids through school or go on amazing vacations or retire early. Whatever that thing is for you, I want you to start thinking about how you can get there and how you can get there sooner. And you gotta make that first step and buy your very first investment property. Before we do that, if you can hit that like button below, that would help the YouTube algorithm. You can also subscribe to my channel and please feel free to leave comments or questions below. I will definitely answer those comments and questions that you have. And if you'd like to share this video with somebody else that might find this video helpful in terms of buying their first investment property, Property, uh, you can also do that. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first property I ever bought was back in 2002. In 2001, I spent the entire year working over in Japan. I worked at Universal Studios in Osaka, Japan in all of 2001. And the great part about working in Japan was they paid for all my living expenses. Now, you know, they gave me a bicycle and a train pass and a gym membership. Uh, we also got a per diem. I got my salary. And at the end of the year, if we completed our contract, we also got a bonus from our salary. None of that was big money by, by any means, but I was saving my money as best as I could because I, I wanted to be able to buy something when I got back to Canada. And I'll, I'll tell you what, a lot of my friends made fun of me when I was over in Japan. They used to say I was, I was a little bit frugal. I would bring my lunch some days to work where they would go to the cafeteria and buy something and, and they would go out for dinner every single night and I would you know eat at home like at least three or four nights a week. In retrospect, when I look back on it now, I'm so glad that I did that because here's the reality of the situation. I just used my per diem for, for everything that I wanted to buy and I went on trips while I was there. I went out, I had fun, I went to dinners, I bought a couple things like a new camera and a new stereo and I did all of that on my per diem and my salary I never touched my salary through the whole year and at the end of the year I also got a bonus and I got paid in US dollars and I brought that money back to Canada and the, you know the exchange rate back at that time was very favorable for the Canadian dollar when I got back to Canada at the end of that year I essentially had about $80,000 in, in, uh, in savings and I looked at how I wanted to be able to invest that money. And really the only thing that I, that I knew that I wanted to do was, was buy real estate. And I didn't have any experience in real estate. I don't come from a real estate investing family, but I knew I wanted to buy a property. 
I also knew that I didn't want to spend all that money. I didn't want to spend the entire $80,000 on a property. I wanted to only spend uh, about half of that money. I didn't want to spend it all. So I started to look at, and first thing I looked at, and this is the first thing that you're going to want to look at too, is where is this money going to come from? Because you know, there's an expression in real estate that we have to have money to make money. And that's absolutely true. The part that they don't tell you is you got to have money to make money, but it doesn't necessarily have to be your own money. In my case, I had my own money and so I was able to use that to be able to buy my first property. But I know a lot of people that get into real estate investing with what we call OPM, that's other people's money. Uh, that could be a joint venture partner, that could be uh, parents or friends or relatives that are lending you money to be able to go out and buy your first property. So it doesn't necessarily always have to come from us, but I did that in my case. I had the money I wanted to be able to invest in my very first property. But first step in the process is planning and budgeting and, and where is that money gonna come from and how much of that money do you wanna spend? So after I figured out kind of how much I wanted to spend, then I started looking at which markets I wanted to invest in. And I was living in Toronto at the time. I started to look at some condos because that was really the only thing that I could afford. In 2002 in Toronto, I was looking at condos right downtown. For those of you that know the Toronto market, it was like Young and College, which is like the heart of downtown. And 600 square foot condos were going for around $200,000 at the time. I thought that was crazy. I thought, why would anyone spend $200,000 on 600 square feet? Um, yeah, I wish I'd bought 20 of them because they're probably worth about $800,000 now, but I digress. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Retrospect is always 2020 when it comes to the real estate market. I started to look at that market and realize, you know what, this is a lot of money and I'm gonna be what's called probably house poor if I buy a $200,000 condo because the majority of my money that I had saved would have been going into the purchase of that condo and then I still had to be able to afford the monthly payments and things like that. I decided to look elsewhere and this is something that I think I, I did well, I did right, is that I looked at a market that I could afford versus the market that I wanted to live in uh, because those are two very different things. The market that I could afford and one that I knew very well was the Alberta market. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Red Deer, Alberta. So I decided to go and look at that market in comparison to the Toronto market. For a 600 square foot condo in Toronto, I was looking at about a $200,000 investment. A single family dwelling, uh, you know, owning the land and the property and everything in, in Alberta and Red Deer, Alberta was about $125,000 to $135,000. For me, it was a, a better investment at the time. It seemed like it made more sense and it was more affordable. It was something that was not going to stretch me too thin and I felt like I really was able to be able to do that. Now I would suggest um, focusing on markets that you know relatively well. So for me, I was living in Toronto, so I knew that market well. I grew up in Alberta. I knew that market relatively well. And specifically, I knew Red Deer really well. I knew street by street. I knew the good areas of town. I knew the not so great areas of town, the areas that I wanted to avoid. That's the second step in the process is figuring out where you want to invest. And you'll want to get really local. You'll really want to look at the demographics of the neighborhood, what kind of people are living in these properties and what your future tenants might look like as well. So those are all the things you want to start to look at when you start to look at where you want to invest. After I picked Red Deer as my market, I decided on what kind of property I wanted to buy. And I'd love to say that I really had my mind open about this. I didn't really know any different. I was like, okay, it's, it's a single family dwelling. That's all you can really do. And I was looking at basically a whole bunch of variations of a single family dwelling. I was looking at townhouses, I was looking at you know single family dwellings, or I was looking at a half duplex, you know, still see one single unit. That was what we call one door. One door means there's you know one revenue to support that one door under that one roof. If I could have done this over again, I probably would have looked at something a little bit different, but at the time that was all I kind of knew, so I decided to go ahead and buy that one door. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I know people who've been very successful buying single family dwellings and condos and that's all they buy. But I think knowing what I know now, I would have made a slightly different decision. But at the time, that was all I really looked at. But when you're looking at what kind of property you want to buy, there's all different kinds of properties. You know, there's duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, six units and above that gets into multi-unit or apartment investing. And then your financing rules change. So there's all kinds of different things that you can do as a real estate investor, but don't limit yourself to looking at one certain style of property. When I started to look at the Red Deer market, I started to look at mostly new properties because there was a lot of inventory in terms of things that were being 
built at the time. I looked at a couple different things. I, I looked at a townhouse, a brand new development. I looked at a brand new single family dwelling. But what I settled on was a brand new property. I came back four months later and the property was complete. It was a beautiful little two bedroom by level. The property cost me $130,000. And how I thought I was gonna make that a successful transaction is I thought, I'll buy that property and I'll finish the basement. So it'll be uh, four bedrooms, uh, three bathrooms, and then I can rent that out for a lot more money than a two bedroom, two bathroom. You know, that's another part of your budgeting and, and the, the amount of money that you wanna spend because I also had to look at, you know, what was the renovation gonna cost? So not only was it the down payment and the closing costs and, and all of that, but I also had to look at, you know, what was the renovation gonna cost? And that's the next step in the process. After you figure out your budget, after you figure out where you want to invest, you figure out what kind of property that you want to buy, then you start looking at how do you buy that property. Then I started to create my team. Your realtor, your mortgage broker, your lawyer, your accountant, your property manager, your home inspector, your contractor, and your insurance broker. Those are all people that are part of my team. In this case, the first person I needed was my mortgage broker. So I had to go to a mortgage broker and say, can I qualify for this property? He came back, he ran his calculations, he looked at how much cash I had, what my credit was like, looked at all those things, and came back and said, yes, with a, a cosign, we'll be able to get you that that loan on the property. Obviously then in order to get the mortgage, I needed to prove I had insurance. So I found an insurance broker, my realtor. I didn't really use a realtor on this transaction because I went to a builder. So builders often have, you know, sales centers and they'll have people that are dedicated to them. They are real estate agents usually, but they, they specifically work for the builder. So I didn't necessarily need a realtor, but I needed a lawyer for sure to close out that transaction. Didn't need my accountant at that point. I definitely use my accountant more now that I have multiple properties. But at the time I just, you know, filed my tax return and I owned that property in my personal name as well. So it wasn't hugely complicated. I ended up contracting the property myself. I was a 25 year old kid. Uh, so, you know, I, I was excited to get in there and learn all about this renovation stuff. And I did some sweat equity and I learned how to hang drywall and I did a little bit of tile work and I did some painting and I hired some of it. I did some of it myself, but it cost me $20,000 to finish the basement at the time. I didn't need a, a home inspector because it was a brand new property. There was nothing to inspect really. Uh, and the other one that I didn't necessarily need at that time was my property manager uh, because I was planning to manage the property myself. You want to start to assemble your team and then in the area that you're investing in. If you can, find people that are specifically catering their businesses to working with real estate investors because they're gonna be able to help you move your business forward just that much faster. Once I figured out that I could buy the property, I could get an approval, I figured out where I wanted to buy, what I wanted to buy, and, and my budget, now I started to look at the numbers. This is so important that you look at the numbers. I started to look at what were the rental rates in the area? What could I rent that property for? What were my expenses going to be? I didn't really know how to calculate cash flow properly at the time. I thought you just looked at, you know, your mortgage, your property tax, your utilities and your insurance and anything above and beyond that was positive cash flow. Yeah, kind of it is, but it's not really because there's a four other things that I would add now for sure. One would be vacancy. You know, it's not a matter of if your property is going to be vacant, it's when. So you want to account for vacancy. Property management, whether you're managing the property or somebody else is managing the property, you've got to look at what the costs are on property management. Repairs and maintenance. Uh, I didn't really have a whole lot of repairs and maintenance for the four years that I owned that property uh, because it was brand new. But if you're buying an older property, for sure you want to look at, okay, what's it going to cost if I'm going to have to replace the hot water tank or the roof or all those things fall under repairs and maintenance. Uh, the last thing that I include always is gifts for my tenants. I give my tenants about $100 of gifts per tenant per property per year. I include all of those things now in my, in my cash flow calculations at the time. I definitely did not include all those things. So I probably would have been in negative cash flow if I wasn't managing the property myself and I hadn't bought a brand new property. But you know, that wasn't the case. I was managing it myself. I was looking after the property management. I didn't have a lot of repairs and maintenance. So I was in positive cash flow. It wasn't huge cash flow, but I did have some cash flow on that property. If that property hadn't have cash flowed, I would have walked away. Because it's an investment property, you wanna make sure that it's not an emotional decision. When you're buying a property to live in as your principal residence, now you start to get, you start to fall in love with that property. But when it's just an investment, you wanna look at it from the numbers perspective and the numbers don't make sense 
you got to walk away from that property. There's always another property coming along the line. So don't be afraid to walk away if the numbers don't make sense. There was definitely a lot of wins on the first one. A couple of things that I did wrong and that I, that I, you know, I would do over again if I could. And the thing that I'm most proud of is that I got into the market at 25 years old. You know, a lot of people my age were, were not buying property and not buying investment property especially. So I was super excited that I was able to do that and I'm so glad that I did. It really set me up for the rest of my life. I was able to take that one property and parlay that into, you know, two or three properties within a couple of years. And that really got me on this sort of train with real estate investing and I got really excited about buying properties and having tenants and using this rentals and having passive income. And the more of these that I did, the more experience experience that I got. It was a success for me. I, I'm so glad that I did it. Uh, and I hope that you have found something out of this video that you'll find that is going to inspire you to be able to get out there and buy your first investment property. With that, I'll say thanks so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon. So you probably clicked on this video wondering how to begin investing in the stock market. And that's what I'm going to share with you today is five steps that I personally took when I began to invest. But first, if you are new to the channel and you are interested in wealth building strategies such as stock market investing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you find value in this video, smash that like button and leave a comment down below. The first step I recommend everybody to do is open a brokerage account. All right. Investigate which one is right for you first, because you want to know how they function before you actually commit to one. The second thing is, is they don't cost anything to open an account or to keep them open per month. This is the reason why I recommend having a brokerage account is because they offer educational materials that you can use to understand how to invest, as well as tools to help you find companies that you may be interested in pursuing. Another reason why is because it provides you a place to put your money while you are researching into companies that you may potentially buy that is not so easily accessible. So for example, once you put money into the account, you can use it right away, but to pull it out, it takes around three business days for that money to transfer back to your checking account. So in a sense, it's out of sight, out of mind, and you'll think twice before trying to pull it out. The second thing, which is related to money, how much money should you use or begin to invest with? And how do you get that money? What I recommend is taking about 15% of your paycheck and putting it into the brokerage account. When you have around $100 to $500, that is how much you should begin to invest with. Experiment a little bit, learn and grow and make mistakes because that's how you're gonna to learn to invest the, the best. The reason why I don't recommend starting out with a larger sum of money is because the market is an emotional roller coaster, all right? Whenever the market goes up, you get super excited and you feel like you need to sell out right away. And whenever it goes down, you feel like you need to sell out and cut your losses before you lose all your money. Know that the market goes up and down on a daily basis. So when you purchase a stock, you need to get used to those emotions. And that's why I recommend starting out with something small so that you're not as worried about it. That goes into our third thing, which is which stock should you actually invest in? I mean, there are so many businesses out there that you can invest in today. What I recommend doing is when you're starting out with 100 to $500 is start out with a price range, all right? Typically with that much money, you wanna start from a range of $5 to $20. Don't go below $5 because those are penny stocks and they're high risk and they're a bad representation of what the market is like. Also, don't go above $20 because you don't have so much money to actually invest and therefore you don't want to buy individual stocks. You wanna buy them in a bulk. You wanna buy them in a lump sum. That way you can sell out portions at a time instead of just having to sell all of it just at once, all right? Now, when you're trying to figure out which company that you are interested in buying, you want to look at things like their PE ratio, their EPS, their beta, their price. If you're interested in any of these terms, I'll have links in the description below that explains what they are. You also want to look at their financial records, make sure that they are profitable. And if you know what a 10Q and a 10K is, I really strongly recommend looking into those to help you better understand what those companies are about. Always buy companies that you understand their business model and how they make their money and that you can see a potential future in. After you look at around 20 to 50 companies, 
you have a good idea of what is a good company and what is a bad company and which company you should buy, which is the fourth step. When you have that company, buy it. Buy as many shares as you can, which goes into the fifth step, which is hold on to them. Whether the market goes up, whether the market goes down, because right now you want to callous yourself against the emotions of your money going up and down because you have one goal in mind, buy a stock, hold on to it and let it build up. And then when you feel like it is at its max or the company is going nowhere, you can sell out and make huge gains with it. Now, let me tell you about the first time I bought into the stock market. I followed these exact same steps with a few additional steps that I explained in the video. And I will tell you what those are in the story. Uh, the first thing I did was I opened up a brokerage account. I used their educational material to understand more about stock market trading. I used their tools to find uh, potential companies that I would invest in. And I finally found one that I was comfortable with. And all the while I was taking money and putting it into this brokerage account, getting ready to buy. I got up to about $500 and I found the company and I bought as many shares as I could. The part about investigating into the company that I didn't truly understand about was the 10Ks and the 10Qs and also predicting how the company will perform in the future. So use those and try and understand more and avoid the mistake I made there. But the point is, is that I followed the steps and then I bought and then I held on, okay? And the very first day I bought them, the next day that dropped and I felt a little queasy thinking, did I make the right decision? And then the next day it went up and then it went down and then it went up and the whole time I'm sitting there like, well, this is kind of an emotional roller coaster. Like I said, anyways, one day it went up and I was up like $150 and I was like, should I sell out? And I was like, well, it could, it could potentially go up higher. So I, I held on the next day it dropped low, lower than what I purchased them for. And it stayed down there for like a month straight. And I was like, oh, I should have sold out when I had the chance. Anyways, when it went up to where I was up $33, I decided to sell out. I was like, okay, well, I, I feel like I need to investigate more into this company before I really invest into it. Um, I kept an eye on the company and it went up and down, up and down for a good eight months. Finally, it went up and up and up. And I bought this company for, I bought these shares for about $6 and 58 cents a share. And it eventually reached $26 and some change. That would have been a $2,000, $2,600 profit from what I purchased it for. And you know what? I'm glad it didn't work out for me. I'm glad I sold out at the point I did. Because if I would have waited and gotten all that money, I probably would have done the same exact action of not investigating too far into the company for the next company that I would have purchased, which would have been devastating if it wasn't that good of a company and I lost all that money at that time. Now that didn't happen, but it could have. But now I know a lot more, I've learned from my mistakes. And you know, you learn from your mistakes and that's what you need to do is dip your toe into the pool of investing, learn from your mistakes and grow from it. And then when you learn, you can make bigger decisions and bigger investments in the future that will help you grow your wealth. Anyways, that's what I got for you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, smash that like button and leave a comment down below. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next video. So, you've got a 401k. Now what? Even if you leave the heavy lifting to the Brainiacs at Guided Choice, it's a good idea to know how investing works. And if you're the do-it-yourself type, you need to understand how to invest appropriately. Don't worry, we're not going to show you tons of math. All you need to know to get started is that there are three big types of investments called asset classes, stock, bonds, and cash. Stock is just ownership in a company. There are many ways to classify stock. Two major ones are size, called market capitalization, or cap and company location. Each classification has its own typical level of risk. Large cap stocks include the 500 biggest companies in the US. Apple, Walmart, Disney, Ford, McDonald's. Ever heard of the S&P 500 or blue chips? Same thing. Keep in mind, all stock is risky, but these are generally considered the least risky. 
Mid-cap stocks include roughly the next 400 companies by size, smaller but still fairly well established. They're considered riskier than large cap. Following large cap and mid cap, take the next 2,000 companies and you've got small cap stock. While they have potential for greater growth, they also have the greatest risk. Then there's international stock. Ownership in companies located in developed nations outside the US, like BMW in Germany and Sony in Japan. They carry about the same level of risk as US-based large cap stocks. The highest level of risk is found with emerging market stock. This is stock in companies located in developing nations like India, Mexico, and Russia. There are two ways to make or lose money in the stock market. You see, when you own a stock, you actually own a piece of a company. And as the value of that company increases, the stock price goes up. But if the value of the company goes down, the stock price goes down too. These fluctuations determine the amount of profit or loss. Another way to make money is when the company shares its yearly profit with you in the form of a dividend. Stock prices can go up or down dramatically for all kinds of reasons. As a result, stocks are the riskiest types of investment in your plan. But over a long time, they can also be the most rewarding. Next up, bonds. Bonds are just a loan to a company or government. They borrow by selling a bond, which is simply a promise to repay the buyer in a fixed number of years at a fixed interest rate. When you hear about the U.S. government borrowing money, have you ever wondered who they borrow from? Chances are, it's you, through the investments you make in bonds. If interest rates go down after you buy a bond, its value goes up. If interest rates go up, then your bond value will go down. How much the value goes up or down with a change in the interest rate depends on how long the bond is. The longer the bond, the more risk, as the more the value will go up or down with interest rate changes. However, in general, bonds are less risky than stocks. Cash is, well, cash. In a 401k, it's usually available as a money market or stable value fund. Unlike other assets, there's little risk that your money will lose value. But that doesn't mean there's no risk at all. If you hold too much cash, you are at risk that inflation will leave your money worth less compared to everything else. For example, in 1950, a nickel would buy you a Coke. But if you saved that nickel until today, you wouldn't have enough to buy that same Coke. Cash loses value over time. Most people with 401k plans invest in mutual funds. These hold many different individual stocks or bonds chosen by professionals for a given level of risk and potential reward. So, how do you choose the right mix for your specific needs? You may be surprised to hear that according to the majority of corporate pension plans in the world, there really is a single best way. It's called modern portfolio theory. The details are a lot of math. But understanding what's behind all the numbers is remarkably simple. In fact, you've probably already heard of it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You balance risk and reward by holding lots of different types of investments. The technical term is diversification, and it's the name of the game in investing. So how do you do it right? Most of us understand that if we take more risk, we expect more return. Let's look at the math. The line shows us that for any given level of risk, we can expect a certain rate of return. More risk, more return. The challenge, as you may be aware, is that markets don't move in a straight line. They go up and down. The goal is to buy low and sell high. When one investment type is down, you want to buy. At the same time, you want to sell an investment that is high. In the long run, they all tend to move up just at different rates based on risk. Remember, this is your retirement savings, so to invest well, you need to diversify. The goal of diversification is what modern portfolio theory is all about, getting an optimal rate of return for the risk in the long run. To do that, you want to invest on what is known as the efficient frontier. The details of drawing the curve are just a lot of math, you could spend the spare hours of your days creating the efficient frontier on a very large spreadsheet, or you can let experts do it for you. In fact, the answers are already right where you want them.
online, and probably already in your 401k plan. Guided Choice can give you personalized advice recommending a specific mix of stocks, bonds, and cash to reach your retirement income goal. You can even use it to try different strategies and project the results. Whether you take the investment recommendation from our brainiacs or choose to do it yourself, hopefully now you're a little more confident about how retirement investing works. Just remember, if you do it yourself, you need to rebalance your account at least annually to stay on the efficient frontier.